a question. <laughs> and I think it's, um, I get a lot of very good questions that um, I think if people have the chance to hear other people ask questions or have their questions themselves answered, uh, I think that helps give a lot more um, understanding between these, these multiple cultures of science and indigenous science, uh, convergent and convergence mm -hmm. science. So I think, you know, if, if I could have, I'll present some of my slides. I might go through them a bit fast, um, but I think that I would like to at least have 20 minutes for questions and answers. That sounds great. I think you're right. I think it's going to generate a lot of, of discussion and interest. And it's, you know, it's a little different than our, our average CGD seminar. And people are really excited about that. So um, I see that we're live on YouTube. So if you I went ahead and, and set it up because I know I've gotten a lot of interest on your seminar, Paula. So I thought, ah, oh, let's just get the, the YouTube going so everybody isn't yeah, so at this point, there's a button in the top, at least I'm seeing a button at the top that says copy streaming link. And so you can always go ahead and share that with anyone directly uh, if they want the direct link to. The yeah, screen. all I see is the recording live on YouTube. Um, yeah, it looks oh, like I see now I can see the copy streaming link. Yeah, right. Um, I did send that to my friend, Michelle. She just wanted to have uh, her class up in uh, University of Washington, Tacoma, uh, w w watch it. And um, I didn't really promote this. I figured that, that it uh, would be available later if anybody wanted to watch it. Yeah, well, that's true as well. It's always, it's going to be up on YouTube. Um, we, did, uh, we did promote it on Twitter. We always promote the CGD seminars on Twitter. So you might get some interest there as well. Excellent. And Paulette, I'm going to go ahead and make you a co-host. Perfect. Yeah. So the other thing is we, we really do wait until at least 11 to start because people are just trickling in. And um, Tracy will keep this intro slide up until I start introducing you. And then you're free to share your slides at any time. All right, I'm going to mute real quick and turn down one of my blinds so it's not so sure. bright. Thanks.
Welcome everyone, we'll get started in just a few minutes. All right, looks like we have a good group and counting. Uh, Paulette, are you ready to get started? Okay, um, so a couple of quick announcements before I introduce our first uh, seminar speaker for 2021. Uh, so welcome back everyone, happy new year. Um, as, as usual, just a few Zoom ground rules. We ask everyone to please stay muted during the presentation. Um, we will have uh, plenty of time for questions. We're gonna have extra time for discussion um, during this seminar. So definitely be thinking of all your great questions and discussion topics. And as always, you can either type those into the chat and I'll read them aloud uh, during the question and answer, or uh, you can use the raise your hand feature, which is in the participants window on Zoom. And uh, we and uh, unmute yourself to ask your question. Uh, and as always, as Tracy had on the intro slide, please remember to uh, be respectful and share the air during discussion. Also, uh, we are still scheduling CGD seminars uh, for the spring. There's open spots available in March through May. So please get in touch with me if you'd like to present or if you uh, know someone who would like to speak. And all the seminars are at this point planned to be virtually on Zoom. So I'm very happy to introduce our first CGD speaker of 2021, Paulette Blanchard from the University of Kansas. Uh, Paulette is a PhD candidate in the Department of Geography and Atmospheric Science at KU, as well as a recent UCAR Next Generation Diversity and Inclusion Fellow. She received her bachelor's in Indigenous and American Indian Studies from Haskell Indians Nation Indian Nations University in 2012, and her master's in geography and environmental sustainability from the University of Oklahoma in 2015. Paula is also a steering committee member and organizer for the Rising Voices program, which facilitates intercultural relational based approaches and collaborations that bring indigenous studies and earth sciences into partnership. She was featured in and co-PI on a documentary entitled Listening for the Rain, Indigenous Perspectives on Climate Change, which was included in the email that we sent around about this seminar. Uh, I believe it's also posted on the seminar website. If you didn't get a chance to watch it yet, I highly recommend it. So her research interests include indigenous geography, feminism, ethics, and environmental and social justice. Today, she will speak about centering Native voices in Indigenous sciences to address climate change. Take it away, Paulette. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me well? Yeah, you sound great. Excellent, excellent. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, uh, introduce myself real quick. Haki Hewesi Lasimamo. My name is Paulette Blanchard. I'm a citizen of the Absentee Shawnee Tribe of Oklahoma. I reside in what is not our traditional homelands, but what has become the um, our homelands through relocation. So in some ways, Oklahoma tribes are the first uh, Native peoples who have experienced forced relocation and the climate changes that come along with that. So there's an interesting story that lies in how the tribes have adapted and adjusted and survived that here in Oklahoma and created new relationships with place. 
So uh, let's go ahead and I'll start my slides here. Oops, go back one. Well, let's just start off with the 2020 uh, residual. Let's let 2020 go. So thank you guys for uh, coming and participating in this, in this discussion today. I'm gonna loosely set this discussion up around indigenous knowledge and indigenous education, indigenous science, because it's all intertwined. Indigenous people have a very close relationship with place because it's, it's a relatedness a relationship, a responsibility, and a, rest, a reciprocal relationship with place so that survival of and thriving of, a, of the different peoples of the Americas and many other indigenous communities have uh, can be successful. So let's talk about these knowledge systems. You know, we have Western science concepts and indigenous science concepts. And if you look at this list, they don't always... Um, support each other. Sometimes they're in, in conflict or in opposing perspectives, such as science is deeply grounded in Eurocentric uh, Western concepts of, of their history, their lens of their epistemology and ontology, their cosmologies even. So to consider the possibility of, of Meshing together these two worldviews is not exactly in the best interest of either group for one, but also it doesn't support the idea of diversity. Science has become a monoculture, which is only one system of methods and methodologies that are accepted. It self-legitimizes. Uh, what can be measured is what counts as science, where indigenous people have always looked at things cyclically in patterns over time. And there's a, a respect and a reverence for all life and life from an indigenous perspective is, is energy of any type of energy. And that can be broken all the way down into how a molecule is, you know, the energy that every atom has, you know, that indigenous people often equate to a type of life form. So everything has a cycle, it has a pattern and indigenous people focus on that pattern and that the outliers in Western science often get dismissed where indigenous science and indigenous knowledges look to the outliers because often it is believed that that is where the innovation or the revel, you know, revelation happens, you know, of, of change, often good, sometimes not, but paying attention to those outliers is an important component of indigenous knowledge systems. So let's look at a little bit of the indigenous worldview. Everything has, uh, spirituality is embedded in every element. That includes the earth and all of its systems and cycles and materials. Uh, again, looking at that metaphysics and the physics of energy. Humans have a responsibility. We don't have a right to clean air and clean water. We have responsibilities to these things. And that is something that long-term shifts in science culture hopefully will support and come to uh, realizing instead of this idea of greenwashing with the word sustainability, looking beyond that and being more proactive and intentional with things like um, restorative science or rebuilding ecosystems. Now we understand we can't go back to the way things used to be, but there can be things that can be done to restore our earth to a a better than sustainable but thriving system. Um, natural resources are not, they're not resources, they're relatives. It's more than a gift. These, the things that we get as resources are gifts from relatives and they have to be retreated, treated as such. Uh, the reciprocity, honoring nature on a daily basis, wisdom and ethics are derived from experiences. So it's more than just observation. It's um, a full experience in all of the senses can often be uh, involved with understanding the world around us. And Native people have always required that holistic and physically and spiritually engaged experience, and sometimes even the supernatural, uh, because not everything can be explained by science. So in that, con in that 
idea, we have to be able to accept that things happen that we are not capable or uh, understand fully yet, but are willing to explore further at some point. And let's see, of course, ever-changing natural forces. Nothing is set forever. We um, Time is cyclical with cycles. Um, and nature will always possess unfathomable mysteries. That is one of my favorite things because not everything has been explained or um, is understood. And some things, this is kind of one of my favorite stories my great grandmother told me is that um, our, our universe is vast and huge, you know, and it's hard for us to wrap our mind around how incredibly vast the, the galaxies and the universe and everything is sometimes, but that we cannot understand how we on this particular planet are influenced by where we're at in our galaxy's turn, within our solar system's turn, um, influenced by things in space we don't even know might be happening, but that we just accept that things happen that we haven't, we haven't explored or under, understood yet, and maybe someday will, but in the meantime, we just know that things happen and we accept that, they, that they're unfathomable at, at points. Um, and human, the human role is to participate in the orderly design of nature and respect for elders. Uh, they, they are the keepers of, of the connection to the past and our future. And having a sense of empathy and kinship with other forms of life, that is recognizing that in the soil and in the water are the same minerals and materials that are in our bodies. A tree can get hurt and can heal itself. A tree can die and it has water and other minerals in its being as we do. So there's this relationship, this relatedness, this literal genetic relatedness to place and to these things that we exist with in place. And that there should be a, a human relationship with nature is continuous two-way or multiple way, non-transactional, but relational dialogue. Here's this a life uh, learning model from First Nations up in uh, Canada. It just kind of wanted to show you how it's, how indigenous pedagogy in different places incorporate these multiple things that are related to how we not just understand our world, but how we engage with science and spirituality and everything being connected, spiritual, social, political, economic, and how these underlying things, such as in the roots of this tree, come from all of these areas of our cultures. And every culture has similar construct constructs of how to be uh, engaged with the world and learn from the world around them. And if you notice this slice of the tree here to the right comes out of the center of the tree and it talks about the, the learning rings of the individual. And I'm sorry, it's not uh, real clear. I can get a link to this particular uh, document, Learning Indigenous Science from Place. You can probably Google it. It's an incredible document on, on education systems. Here's the Metis similar system. Now let's talk about some comparing of these knowledges, you know, um, the assumption of truth to something to be a truth, and then science being the best approximation. Uh, sacred and secular are together, whereas secular only in science, Western science, teaching through storytelling and didactic, learning by doing and experiencing, which is to me one of the most important components of science that we've lost is more in the field time earlier, having native or having all of our students in our education systems be engaged with hands-on uh, interactions with place and the sciences that they're interested in learning because that creates a um, long-term effect of having a responsibility to place and understanding the relationships required. Um, let's see intuitive, holistic, subjective, experiential, all against the hypothesis-based, reductionist, ob objective, positivist. So these are just some of the many ways we can see this contrasting um, perspective of knowledge systems. Now, one is not better than the other, but they do help us understand some of the challenges necessary to work collaboratively across worldviews and support these diverse science 
uh, systems, uh, indigenous place-based knowledges and sciences are based in um, tens of thousands of years of experiential and observational tested knowledge uh, and, and experiences. So uh, when it comes to the comparisons between the use, here are some of the different ways that we look at the world. You know, I like to look at the uh, explanation based on examples and anecdotes and parables, kind of telling you the morals of the story and why these systems um, react or act the way they do and how we should act with them uh, versus the explanation based on hypothesis theories and laws. And then the whole class classification system I think is really important and use useful so that science can sometimes relax some of its own hubris and re realize that these are not um, anecdotal systems. They're very time proven and because the way it's transmitted is different doesn't make it less valid. So let's talk about how that comes into play with climate. Well, a lot of native students and a lot of native scientists have come to the conclusion that we have to lead because uh, following hasn't been helpful. Indigenous people have been trying to educate and inform science since contact. And some of that knowledge has been um, useful for the thriving and the success of the Western system and the settlers and colonists. And some of it has been misappropriated or detrimental to the native peoples. So in, re in response to the decolonization of myself as a native person who is also mixed race, but also likes to navigate geography, which is the understanding and learning of place with science and climate science specifically, I have to be conscientious of the indigenous protocols and etiquettes. And some of that comes down to the methods of indigenous research which other scholars have talked about the four R's of research, of uh, respect, relevance, reciprocity, and responsibility. I, in my work, have found that there's a couple of more that we're not really talking about, which is often, uh, which is the relevance and redistribution, how those things uh, are, how science is relevant to the indigenous people that science often wants to work with or learn from or be in service to, but also how that, is redistributed to the communities. How is that useful to those communities? Data sovereignty, that all information is not for public domain. Some is tribally specific. And learning how to support indigenous self-determination and sovereignty comes from recognizing that some data should be uh, protected within the communities. There are indigenous research protocols and etiquettes that are easily accessible. The indigenous people's climate change work, or, uh, the indigenous people's climate change working group is one group that supports this and tries to inform others. But the indigenous people specialty group at the American Association of Geographers has a uh, link that will supply the uh, individual who's who's looking for it, all kinds of different resources on how to work with different groups from different locations, how to approach uh, a community in a good way, how to protect uh, their knowledges and so on and so forth. And another thing that's coming up nowadays that should be more talked about in science is the indigenous review boards, because often we do these IRBs uh, from the institutional review board, which often are designed to protect the institution. Uh, on, this, on the premise that this work is being done to protect the five uh, vulnerable groups. And I don't know, that could have changed re recently, but the five original vulnerable groups, according to the Nuremberg trials and the research that came out of the Tuskegee e experiments is the mentally ill children, the elderly prisoners and Native Americans. Now, while it was originally designed for protecting from medical experiments, what indigenous people have come to learn is that protecting cultural knowledge and place-based knowledge and uh, culturally specific information is also important and can be detrimental to a community. So having an indigenous review board or often tribe will have their, tribes will have their own IRBs um, is important to consider when wanting to work with tribes, especially in climate work, and then the relevance to the of the research to people in place. Here are some of the ethics, you know, why? Places are made, you know, who, who's, who's ethics and why? Where and why these matter? So when it comes to the 
the idea of doing research with indigenous communities, especially in climate, you know, we have to really understand, you know, who's this work for? Where, where is this being done and why does that matter? Whose voices are at the table and who decides that? And how was place and place agency considered in these experiences? You know, we talk about places being sacred, yet science still struggles with the idea of recognizing and respecting some of these sacred places such as Mount Achaia or even sacred waters like uh, Standing Rock advocated not only to protect the water but to protect the grave sites that um, some scientists that support fossil fuels had dis dismissed the relevance of indigenous needs and indigenous importance to place and this has create, created generations and generations of, of violence sometimes supported by science. Science has, has been one of the three pillars of assimilation, which are religion, education, and science. So uh, here are other ways that place is made sacred, either uh, by a human event like a war or um, a, a marriage or something important that, to them, uh, a spiritual event where the spirits appear to the humans, Places can be sacred naturally, like amazing waterfalls or some of like uh, Yellowstone, those kinds of sacred places that are made sacred by the earth itself and by the creator. Um, and place has a right to exist, you know? Uh, so all of these things go into an indigenous ethics. Some of the protocols that I had mentioned of the seven R's, the respect, relationship, reciprocity, responsibility, relevance, redistribution, and relatedness. While um, I have an article that's coming, that's in review with AGU right now on breaking down this a little further, just keeping in mind that coming into an indigenous community, these are some of the just the most minimal things that we should be considering when we engage with a community uh, that has that has need, be it a, a scientific need of some sort of, or another. And they often are more in tune with what their needs are than coming in with an idea, hey, I have the science research money, I wanna do this in your place. Instead saying, hey, we're interested in doing some research. What are some of the things in your area that you think we should be paying closer attention to? And the reason I love this slide so much is here we have the water cycle from an indigenous perspective, right? I just think it's absolutely beautiful to see how indigenous people place themselves within this cycle and as a responsible, res responsible participant of the cycle. Um, so if you have more questions on this, these seven protocols, um, I'm more than happy to talk about it uh, later. So we talk about self-determination in science and you know, how can some of these, uh, these philosophies be applied in STEM, but also in climate science in research, um, how can they be applied in this era of climate change? Well, we have to be we have to be more willing to let down the control and realize that we are co-collaborators. Indigenous people, like elders that are hunters or farmers or medicine people, they each carry some knowledge, deep knowledge of place that is passed on through generations, and to come in and assume yourself to be the expert on something, but you come into a place that you've, you've never really been or maybe you've read about, but not in, consider the value of generations of knowledge, it becomes that conflict point. So coming in with some humility and being humble in our science and in our ways when we work with indigenous communities is gonna carry a lot more um, care or buy-in from the community as well as longevity because many people, many Dan Wildcats, one of my favorite sayings he says is that people don't care what they, they don't care what you know until they know that you care. And I think that's important because in science, historically relationships have been a negative. And in indigenous science, relationships are a criteria. We want to know who you are and why you want to know these things. And if you're a if you're okay to carry some of this responsibility of the knowledge forward, and if you can be trusted with these knowledges, because historically there's not a really good track, look, track record of science's res uh, responsibility to the knowledges uh, they've in inquired or incorporated from tribes. And so how can we work across worldviews? I think right now is one of the most incredible opportunities science has had in a very long time. 
for diversity. And diversity doesn't mean just adding brown and stir um, and making the ivory tower a little more beige, but actually means intentional in engagement with diverse knowledge systems. Di this means urban, rural, um, in engaging with the immigrants of this country and the uh, migrants and the uh, dis the disability community and the LGBT plus communities, because when there's a crisis, a climate crisis or an environmental disaster, we have a playbook that has most of the material in it for the average mainstream, but that doesn't acquire, that doesn't accommodate the groups that are also engaged in these violent situations of, of not only the disaster itself, but then the social structures that exclude uh, trans people from going to the bathroom of which they identify with, or making sure that they have the medical needs necessary for them. So it is about survival, about indigenous languages surviving, indigenous knowledge transfers being able to happen because we're losing so much of our knowledge through assimilation and through the Western academic system that we, we're, as indigenous people, we're struggling to maintain our cultures and our knowledge and losing our elders at an incredible fat rate, um, especially with COVID and these other um, extremes that are happening in our society today. And we need to be able to maintain our ceremonies and traditions, especially of place, because while it might not be fully understood yet or now, some of the rationale for indigenous people to conduct ceremonies in specific places have, have cultural reasons, but also may someday we find out have scientific reasons too. So some of the things we, in climate science we talk about is this food, energy, water issue. Um, but indigenous people cannot remove the sovereignty and the, the relationship to place. So we have rights versus responsibilities. These are not resources, these are our relatives. And we need to prepare uh, versus repair in our disaster preparedness, uh, looking at renewable energies, food. Oh my goodness, how food has become one of the biggest things in, in COVID as well as any other natural disaster. How do you access food in a, in a crisis? How can your community survive for a period of time until they can be accessed by a FEMA or another disaster or hazard group? Uh, so food, food plots and root to shoot gardening and agroforestry are all things that can be or should be researched more as restorative science processes to uh, support climate resilience. And uh, it's better than sustainability, it's, it's restorative. Uh, that includes our health, our economy, policy changes. But I think one of the important things that we'll be talking about more often now is the science culture shift. How do we change and advance science when it feels in some ways to be stagnating and science, some scientists are just doing science for the sake of doing a science, as opposed to something relevant to place and people for the long term of resilience and uh, restorative systems. So one of the groups that is doing good work and I like to talk about and you all probably know a lot about is Rising Voices. And the reason I feel good about participating in Rising Voices going on our ninth year now is because of the, it does support the diversity and the relationships between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples and science groups. Uh, it supports student faculty and early career scientists, which is a space that sometimes is, is talked about but not often re realized. And from my experience as a, as a mixed race native student who is a woman who is a uh, part of a, the two-spirit community, I have felt it is a safe space to talk and do science and engage with ideas and collaborate on, on projects. And it is com comprised of, of this diverse group of activists, NGOs, agents, as well as academics and other types of scientists. It supports the equity and inclusion. Some of the things that Rising Voices holds true, which I think the science culture shift should support and advance are, are some of these issues that I raise here of removing the boundaries between science and society, making society uh, more engaged, making 
getting away from this hierarchical system of science and edu science education, quit putting so much value on uh, science as power and more so as science as responsibility. Uh, because knowledge does not ex does not equate with morality as much as it should. Growing a network, it's it grows a network of collaborators across multiple disciplines and cultures. It 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 includes diversity of of multiple ways of knowing and value systems. And indigenous science is science. It's just methods and methodologies are different, as well as adaptive practices and so forth. It advocates for a relational based as opposed to an extractive or transact transactional based science system and relationship between the participants of science and community. It listens, learns and shares across cultures and generations. Uh, it, I look forward to the long-term projects RV has with the M MSIs and the TCUs because I think that that is something that hasn't been supported enough. And at UCAR and CAR, I, I have been quite happy with some of the ideas that we've been able to work towards in making these realities happen, as well as these relationship buildings. You know, trust is built over time, and we need to re recognize and support these long-term relationships because science has an obligation to indigenous people, especially in America where a lot of the knowledge that science started early with that had created the Columbian exchange was based on indigenous knowledge of you know, plants, animals and different systems. And I think the last one here, respect and the awareness of diverse experiences and histories as current relationships, as collaborations are shaped by colonial history. So recognizing the history of science is incredibly important because it is grounded in not only Eurocentrism and patriarchy, but it's also grounded in um, a, a Western worldview, which is, you know, the original racism of creating this, uh, taxonomy of, of, of humans and flora and fauna and indigenous people historically were included in the flora and fauna, which today seems crazy. So I just wanted to share this real quick. I'm not gonna leave this up too long. Uh, this came out of the hazards meeting, the natural hazards meeting where Rising Voices had an opportunity to have a panel. And I thought that some of the things on this were really cool talking about um, how do we drive transformative change? Uh, we have to acknowledge emotional connection to place. It's more than emotional connection. It's, from, it's a responsibility to place and that we have to be the change and youth have to be engaged and so much more. So I, I'm gonna go ahead and move past this one and talk about RV does have uh, emerging issues. We have working groups around energy, health, phenology, relocation, and water. And if you have not attended a Rising Voices, I encourage you to, to catch on to one and share it with other people you know, because it's a great opportunity to learn, uh, meet people you can ask questions of, build relationships for potential future work, but also just, um, it's, they're just a lot of fun. Another group I spoke about is the Indigenous Peoples Climate Change Working Group, which is out of Haskell led by Dan Wildcat, myself and a, and a few others to engage tribal college students with the best opportunities of indigenous and Western sciences to ground our students and mentor them, ground them securely in their, in their traditional knowledge systems and let them understand that they are valid in their, in their understanding of the world, that they do not have to fully assimilate to be part of the system of science and uh, research, that it's important that we bring both ways together so that we can understand when to use one versus another and what is most appropriate in what place at what time. Because science, it, the one size fits all idea is, is unrealistic and it's, uh, it doesn't fully support the diverse place knowledges that exist. And 
engaging Native peoples in their own knowledges and their own ways of knowing, giving them all the tools of both Indigenous science and technology, as well as Western sciences and technologies, really creates opportunity for more academic freedom, more diverse thinking, more diverse research projects, as well as diverse opportunities towards understanding solution potentials. Um, so it does, this, it supports TCU faculty. It also talks about uh, long-term relationships of convergent science and supplements science with diverse thinking as well as the deep place knowledges, which I tend to uh, repeat a lot because it's important, I think. And I'm sorry, my dog, if you hear in the background is having a bad dream. <laughs> so Nyawe, thank you so much. And I would really like to open it up to some questions and any comments or what have you, if, if anybody has any. Thank you so much, Paula. That gave us a lot to think about. It's a great discussion material. Really interesting to hear about all the different things that you're involved with. Um, so if you have questions or you have uh, aspects for discussion, you can use the raise your hand feature, which is in the Zoom participants window and um, we'll call on you and you can unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you'd like to ask your question. Uh, you can also use the Zoom chat feature to type your question or discussion point and I can read it out loud. Let's see, it looks like we have a question from Bill Large, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, early on, you, you mentioned the, the concept of outliers. Could, could you elaborate a bit further, maybe with an example of how outliers are treated and leads to advance of knowledge or it's just some, something more? Because it's rather intriguing. Um, well, in the process of learning uh, about Indigenous sciences, yeah. I have been, I have learned not only from my own tribe, but from other people from other tribes who are both community members deeply, deeply engaged with place as medicine people or as hunters or what have you, as well as native people who have PhDs and work in sciences uh, specifically. And so one of the things I've learned along the way is that indigenous science is very focused on patterns because we live by those patterns. We don't have a linear concept of time. We have a cyclical one. We look towards each of the seasons as a potential marker of what that season um, activity is often, you know, if it's, if it's harvest, if it's hunting, if it's, you know, fishing, whatever. And uh, just another quick note, indigenous places are, are given, they're, they're recognized by an adjective or a verb. We recognize place as being alive and having personality, having characteristics and so on and so forth, as opposed to a noun. And because place is a who, not a thing. And so when we do indigenous science and we have become accustomed to the patterns and we can tell by a particular plant or the way an animal or an insect reacts, what kind of winter we might have or what kind of um, preparing preparedness we might need to be uh, cognizant of, uh, when there's something that is amiss and outside of the norm, the outlier of indigenous knowledge of science or the, the indigenous, um, experience they it's important to pay extra attention to something that's not, that's out of the norm because that is something that could be evolutionary something that could alter uh, offer some insight to maybe a shift that's going to happen that we need to prepare for or a way that we might better survive a situation by acknowledging how things have to change life in the world is not stag stagnant you know it's constantly changing its, di its um, dynamic. And so we, we, it's important for us to look for those outliers and try to understand what, what caused that outlier. What is the purpose of that outlier? Does it have a purpose? Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. And Western science has this system of if they look for the pattern and if there's something outside of that pattern, it must be wrong. It must be a mistake. It must be dismissed as opposed to having that focus on, oh, okay, so this is unique. This is something that could be relevant. Maybe we should pay a little closer attention to it. 
because uh, historically science has dismissed that because they're trying to spend the time on narrowing the dissection of something to better understand its most minute parts and still lack the understanding of how that original component interacts with the most the, the larger system. And I think that's where we're at in science now is we're trying to put, science is trying to put back together what it dis dissected so that it can understand how it works in the larger system because being in a global economy, being in a global world, world where pandemic is reality, um, had we paid attention to some outliers sooner, we might've been able to be a little more proactive instead of reactive or just impacted. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, thank you. Great question, thank you. Yeah, several things have come up in the the chat as well. So let's let's start with some of those. Um, there's a comment that you mentioned that knowledge and morality aren't always correlated. Can you say more about that? Vine Deloria Jr. is a native scholar who looked at. He and Dan Wildcat wrote a book, Power in Place. Uh, Dan uh, Vine Deloria has written prolifically on indigenous knowledge and science, um, red earth, white lies, uh, uh, metaphysics of modern existence, and uh, Custer Died for Your Sin. Custer Died for Your Sin is one of the first breakthrough books that Vine Deloria Jr. wrote in regards to discussing mostly anthropology and anthropologists and how that particular science had done a lot of violence to indigenous people. Um, trying to explain an indigenous person and their worldview through a white, often male lens did made a lot of mistakes along the way. And so one of the things that Vine Deloria Jr. talks about is that science has been equated with power instead of knowledge or not knowledge has been equated with power as opposed to knowledge being equated to responsibility and the morality that goes with that. And that, I mean, and he spoke this back in the seventies. So the fact that we're still trying to regulate that relationship between knowledge and responsibility as opposed to knowledge and power is, um, it just speaks to the, the, the continuing need that science and education and knowledge in general has to uh, place to people, to you know, our environment and being more accountable to science or to our science or accountable to the communities that we work with, science doesn't necessarily support accountability. Um, and, that's, and that's a shame. And I think that, you know, for me as a native scholar and somebody who works in climate sciences uh, from an from a ge indigenous geographer perspective, it's important that I have to make decisions that will, I have to believe will impact my grandchildren and my great grandchildren. And so I'm trying to make decisions that are accountable to that. And that's something <clears throat> I hope that this science culture shifts uh, incorporate is that accountability and responsibility and recognizing that, you know, I, I have to come home to my community and make sure that what I did was in a good way so that my community can be proud of me because I'm fighting for the survival of all of my relations, not just the human, but the animal, the plant and the, the bacterial, all of the things that make this earth healthy and thrive. And, um, Sometimes science doesn't necessarily support some of these ideas because they consider them anecdotal or, or whatever. Yeah, thanks. Um, we have another question from Joni about ecosystem restoration. So given that 2021 is the beginning of the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, do you see a particular role for indigenous people to lead these efforts? Are there, oh God. Is there yes. a history that you can, that you can speak about? Um, are there examples? Um, oh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. My favorite, favorite, favorite in the entire United States is the Nisqually Watershed Project up in Washington. Uh, the Nisqually Watershed, Watershed Project started with uh, the Nisqually tribe, Billy Frank Jr., Hank Adams, and a bunch of the people up there started around the hunting and fishing wars where indigenous people were being told they couldn't fish in their traditional places. They couldn't catch fish out of season. And they were like, wait a minute, we have treaties. We have, you know, sovereignty, this, you know, and then eventually the fish were too sick to eat. And then the fish quit coming and the fish started to disappear, the salmon. And the tribes in that region said, hey, this is a sick ecosystem. 
And so they, it started with the tribe, uh, I guess, uh, a farmer had some land at the watershed at the mouth of the river and the farmer didn't want to send, sell it to a, a company that was going to put a casino there. So they sold it to it or a golf course or something. So they sold it to the tribe and the tribe started by planting. They, they re it used to be a, it was, uh, had been a dairy farm. The farmer, when the farmer sold it to the tribe back, you know, give the tribe back their land essentially. And so the tribe started by planting indigenous plants from that place, started by uh, rerouting the stream to be meandering and creating that salt, salt marsh between the ocean and the river. And pretty soon more people were like, hey, this is working. And then they started engaging and building relationships with the schools, not just the universities, but the um, TCUs and the K through 12. And I got to go out and see this watershed. It's my, every time I go, it's always just an amazing experience. And so eventually over time, the tribe was able to work with state, federal, local municipalities and private citizens to reclaim uh, this watershed from the glacier at the top of the mountain to where it meets the sea. And they, they created new, they recreated log jams in the river. They planted plants. They, the university would meet with the K through 12 school bus uh, full of kids and talk about what they're doing, why they're doing it, water samples, uh, and helping plant some of the plants back into these places. And it just kept growing and growing and growing. And it's been almost 15, 20, 30 years maybe now. And it's one of the most pristine watersheds in the entire Western United States. It's one of two completely, um, one, one of two highly restored watersheds that uh, is considered healthy. It's still got a long ways to go. Um, but the eagles came back, the salmon came back, the tribe have uh, fishing fisheries and they work with fish and wildlife services. The army that stole some of the tribe's land in that region actually allowed the tribe to reclaim the water, the, the river that comes through the, the army base there. And they let them put bridges so that the tanks would quit going through the middle of the river and polluting it and creating problems for the salmon spawning and so on and so forth. So there's this incredible collaborative multi agency discipline, generational intergenerational group that have worked very hard together over a long period of time with public buy-in, state buy-in, uh, federal and tribal, you know, and private citizen that is the, to me, the, the standard by which we should all strive to do science and to do work collaboratively. So look it up, Nisqually Watershed. There's all history and all kinds of stuff. Great, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Very positive example. Um, I am hearing that the raise hand feature might be hiding in Zoom since they updated Zoom. So don't hesitate to send a message in the chat if you would like to ask a question out loud but can't find that. Um, Bill Lipscomb has a question, go ahead, Bill. Okay, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Paulette. I, I really enjoyed your talk and, and learned a lot from it. And um, as you were going through the indigenous, talking about the indigenous science worldview and saying things like the universe is holistic, um, nature has unfathomable mysteries, um, the importance of a sense of, sense of empathy and kinship with other forms of life. What I was thinking of is that, that that's my worldview. Um, at, at the same time, I, I'm a scientist and I'm pulled in other directions. But, but I was thinking to myself that maybe there's some misunderstanding and lack of communication in the sense that um, I, I would guess that many of us on this call as science, climate scientists and environmental scientists um, chose this field as opposed to other lines of work in part because we do feel a responsibility for having a harmonious relationship with the natural world. And at the same time, I and probably many of us are very res reticent to talk about that in, in that kind of language um, in scientific settings um, because it doesn't feel safe. Um, it doesn't feel safe because we're concerned people might question our objectivity, like say we have an ulterior motive for, for um, doing the science we're doing. And in particular, because climate science is so politicized mm. that there are climate deniers out there who will say, uh, well, if scientists are all hippie liberals, then you, you can't trust their science. So, so I guess, so, so that's an observation. And I guess the question is, um, if, there's, if there are misunderstandings or a failure to see commonalities as a result of scientists being um, uncommunicative, 
um, how, how do we how do we improve that? How do we break that down? And I can see rising voices as being part of that. And, and, and how, how can we build on that? I think it's already started, you know, I mean, and yes, there are native people that say that climate changes all the time. There are native people that are um, completely have their own opinion, you know, not all native people. I'm not speaking for all native people. My work and what I understand is all I can talk, talk about, you know, so I can't say that all native people, you know, believe this way because it's, it's, it's not true, but the best thing we can do is find people that are like-minded and that find uh, and work together and be willing to, maybe step back and allow the native uh, scientist or community member or, or hunter that has you know generations of knowledge talk about their place and talk about their deep understanding of knowledge. One of the things in the listening for the rain video you'll see is that um, when native people when most native people talk about their place changes, their climate changes, they are very specific and very meticulous about what those changes are, if they're plant, if they're animal, if they're weather, if they're, um, you know, whatever the, it is that they identify as being shifts in their, in their region's climate patterns. Uh, they're a lot deeper than when I asked scientists, you know, what does climate change mean to you? They're like, oh, it's the change in precipitation and temperature over time and, you know, so on and so forth. But when you asked an indigenous person, it was a much different discussion. And I think that um, there's always going to be differing opinions. But when we're asked to be objective, what there's no real true objectivity if you if you think about it, because you're your position as a white male scientist, a white female scientist, a black male scientist, whatever, that experience of your entire life is the lens by which you see the world. And, and it is that lens that you will develop your questions, develop your, your research question, your research methods, your research uh, analysis, and in, to deny indigenous people the same opportunity to look at a question through their own lens is that um, dismissal of indigenous knowledge, of place-based knowledge. And it actually stifles science it, it, and the academic freedom. And I think that's something that we're missing because there was a period of time, especially like back in the 50s and 60s where academic freedom was encouraged. You know, explore the world, be imaginative. And that has somewhere or another been completely eradicated or dis or like you said, we're not supposed to have imaginations anymore. We're not supposed to, you know, try different things because the, the social norm will, will condemn us for it. I hear it all the time, um, but I also got to remind science that it is 525 years away from thinking the world was flat. And, you know, and that, that's important, you know, we have to remember that science that we depend on isn't that very old. And it's not that far from, you know, being, con you know, considering witchcraft valid. Uh, and so we just have to remember the history of science and that it's grounded in, in co colonialism and imperialism. And now the, the challenge is, is how do we as scientists overcome kleptocracy and corporatocracy that tries to drive our science? How do we stay um, relevant to the needs of the people in, in place without being consumed, you know, um, by the system? Because the, self, the system is self-legitimizing. How can you be objective in a system that critiques itself legitimizes itself and decides what within its own world is going to be accepted or not. We have to break that, that get break through that hall of mirrors and, and get people back outside of it to look at the realities that, you know, we're stuck in a rut uh, scientifically, it's, it's academically. We've, the old system is old. We need to start teaching our teachers that come out of university and teach the K through 12, how to teach differently, how to look at science differently, how to engage with multiple worldviews because we are a melting pot. And if, and if we are a melting pot, this American dream, then we really need to diversify how we look at the way we do things and support academic freedom and quit building our knowledges on things that we've already sometimes proven to be false or else that how do we encourage diverse thinkers to enter a system 
where there is no diverse thinking. So it's important that we diversify science in multiple ways, both physically and culturally. But we can't stop, we can't give up. Thanks, Paula. Um, there's a lot of great discussion and questions in the chat. I'm gonna try to combine two questions in the interest of time. Laura asked about an example or story of indigenous and Western science working together. I know you already shared the example of the uh, restorative ecosystem and related to that, Alice is asking um, about, you know, other ecosystems that can't be restored directly, for example, rising oceans or disappearing ice, uh, if you had any uh, thoughts on those topics. Yeah, that's, that's, that's going to be a major problem, especially for indigenous people, because traditionally we didn't have a place, we had a region. And whenever, and we've moved within that region to protect the capability of that region to be, to, to thrive and be healthy. Well, now that we've been removed from our traditional homelands to either reservations, allotments, urban areas, um, or lost our connection to place entirely, it's become a lot more difficult. And now, you know, we need our lands back in a lot of ways. We need to be able to have our languages and our cultures back, but that's gonna have to come from support from, from multiple places like policy, uh, science, uh, education. And, and until we can start, you know, well, I think we've already started this convergent science, this convergence uh, science. And I think it's important that we continue this, this, this thread of working across disciplines, across cultures, across um, municipalities and, and, and places, because traditionally watersheds were a region that indigenous people kind of looked quasi as a boundary. But um, now that all of those things are gone, how do we, how do we protect people when place is disappearing? Well, might want to start looking at like natives getting some of their lands back. You know, there's a lot of indigenous land that is locked up in things called national parks or U.S. forestry or, you know, a lot of other things that uh, by treaty we never relinquished or by treaty should have protected the access or the ability for people to relocate to a different area that was their original homeland. So it's going to it's gonna to have to involve law. It's gonna to have to involve relocation and how that, you know, cause it's not just the native people that are gonna have, that are gonna to have to relocate. There's gonna be a lot of Americans along the oceans, along beaches that are gonna find that their, their multi-million dollar property is, is swamp and they're not gonna be able to sell it for the multi-million dollars that, you know, um, that they expect it to be valued at. And I think the insurance company has been the biggest pusher of the insurance industries has been one of the biggest pushers of recognizing climate and climate change. So how can we partner with these other institutions to, to change policy? And that's what I think it's gonna come down to is, is the collaborative efforts of multiple things happening all at once to push policy because that's where the power is gonna to have to make the change. Thanks. Yeah, Teresa liked the focus on regenerative process versus sustainability. Um, she's asking if you can speak to current regenerative efforts. Um, like I said, the Nisqually watershed is like the first thing that comes to my mind. I know there are more out there. Um, I know a lot of tribes are taking responsibility to support uh, their, the, their regions and try to replenish their lands if it's trying to protect the water. Uh, I know that Winona LaDuke does a lot of work with the rice beds up in Minnesota as well as other tribes in other regions are constantly trying to protect um, their environments and what needs to happen is more of that with community. You know I know a lot of urban spaces are, sh are starting these community gardens. Those are brilliant opportunities to understand how to address food food security, as well as connect people with place in ways that gives them more agency, eradicates food deserts, addresses uh, poverty and, and uh, hunger. So there's a lot of opportunity to look at re regenerative and restorative projects 
in multiple places, be it like some of the work being done in, in uh, Denmark and uh, Germany with green spaces and roof to uh, indoor farming and all of that stuff. There's, there's lots of things that can be done. We just need to uh, support them and encourage policy to, to in develop them. And I'm really proud of the National Science Foundation, I think is stepping up to really try to find ways to uh, be more interdisciplinary, intersectional, intergenerational uh, with the work coming out of some like the COPE project, the, the coastal peoples um, mm -hmm. projects that they're doing. Yeah, that's another, another great example. Um, this might have to be our last question here, but Julio's asking about drought in the Southwest. And I know we've, we've already talked about watersheds, but what about, um, you know, thoughts on how, how rights to use water for different purposes and, and pr probably comes back to policy as well. But if you want to speak about drought specifically. Absolutely, because my, my project, my capstone project, my senior capstone at Haskell was titled Water Change or Climate Change Politics in Oklahoma, the New Indian Wars, and it had to do with water. Um, and I think that's something that around the world is happening and Americans have been sheltered from because at some point, you know, water being the resource, an important resource that it is, and the rate at which it is polluted, and the accessibility to it is, is already, is already something that is, is, it's like the, it's like the bastard child you don't want to admit is, is there, but it's not going to go away. And we need to embrace that. We need to start talking more about uh, water access and dress, because one of the other things about science and its hubris is that there's no long-term understanding, you know, truly ground truth on the history of droughts in like California um, or even the Midwest. We know that things, there have been civilizations that have rise, risen and fallen in the Southwest, like the um, Anastasi and other, other tribes who have, you know, had to disband and, and re, re uh, form as other in other places, but it's it's something that is historically normalized. There have been mega droughts in California. They have found they're learning, and these um, and the depletion of the water tables uh, and the aquifers at the rate that they've been depleted puts us in a precarious situation. We don't really even fully understand how the aquifer um, supports the overall systems of place. And that's something that needs a lot more research, needs a lot more understanding, needs a lot more protection because as corporations start buying up water rights and stealing in some ways water from the people and places that have a right to that, it becomes more than a human issue. It becomes an environmental issue. And you know, there's so much work that needs to be done and to better understand what's happening. And, and for and for policymakers and po politicians to truly understand the gravity and protect protect water. Water has to be protected because it is a human right. It is as important as air and as food. And if we can't have, if any one of those three things disappears, we're all doomed. It's not, you know, mm -hmm. Mother Earth will keep going on and what survives will survive, but there's no guarantees humans will be part of that. Look at the dinosaurs. Thanks so much, Paulette. We're out of time, but thank you so much for joining us and sharing your perspective and your knowledge. As you can see, there was a lot of interest in this talk, a lot of uh, thanks in the chat and um, great discussion comments from everybody. And please feel free to, if you have further questions to contact me through my email and I'd be more happy to have conversations or so on and so forth, but I'm happy to, to help however I can. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so no seminar next week because of the AMS meeting.